Welcome, friends, to this service of worship. Whether you are here in the room with us or joining us from home, we are delighted to have you worshiping together. This morning's service will include the celebration of the Lord's Supper. So if you are worshiping from home and want to take this opportunity to gather something in a cup and some simple bread or cracker, um, we would love to have you participate with us as we celebrate communion together. Today, as part of that communion liturgy, we're going to be singing a simple hymn. It's number 533 in the hymnal, but I don't think you'll need to turn to your hymnal unless you prefer to. Um, the tune is very simple, and the words are printed in your bulletin. So just know that after we have said the Lord's Prayer, we are going to sing together before we share the feast. I also want to call your attention to announcements in the bulletin. In addition to the normal folded announcements, there is a separate uh, insert this week. On one side of that, you'll see all the different scheduled activities, uh, worship services and additional activities for the month of March. So culminating in Holy Week, but lots of wonderful things before um, that time too. You will notice that on Wednesday of this week, we're going to be hosting one of the midweek Lenten services for the ecumenical community so that other churches from the valley are invited to come be with us. I hope that you will, if you are available, will come for that brief service on Wednesday at noon um, and help to welcome the folks who may not be familiar with our, our building and our community. Um, and actually, I'm going to be looking for four folks to take up offering that day. So if you know you're going to be here and would be willing to help take up offering, speak to me at some point or send me an, send me an email. Um, and then after uh, Wednesday, we will gather again on Saturday at 2 o'clock for a memorial service giving thanks to God for the life of Fitz Ledgerton. And there will be a reception in the fellowship hall following that service. I hope you will be here for that if you can. Also have two notes to share with you. I, many of you have received an email letting you know that Flo Bishop, who is the mother of John Bishop, died in her sleep Friday morning. There will not be a local service as John and his sisters will be going to Florida in May to unite their mother's ashes with their father's ashes, which they will do on their wedding anniversary. Please do keep John and Brent in your prayers as they grieve and as they give thanks for Flo's life. And then I also received word this morning that the Reverend Roberta Martin died peacefully on Friday night in the company of her son Curtis and Curtis's wife and their daughter. Uh, many of you know that Roberta and her husband Ed participated in the life of this congregation for long years. Um, Ed served on session and Roberta was, of course, um, a member of the presbytery because she was ordained clergy, but all of us who knew her um, loved her, I think, and, um, and wanted to share that word with you all. I also have permission to share an update with you about Daryl and Mary Franz Spencer. Daryl was hospitalized last week with COVID and also a kidney infection. He was placed in the ICU when he first was admitted by Friday, they felt comfortable moving him to a step-down room, but then yesterday his blood counts kind of went back up, which let them know that the uh, infection is continuing um, to be active in his system. Mary Fran continues to make good progress after also uh, testing positive for COVID. Both of their daughters are here and their son is coming in tomorrow and the family would welcome your prayers. So, friends, unless there are other announcements for the good of the community, let us prepare our hearts for the worship of God.
please stand as you are able and join me responsively in the call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord's stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in God's temple. Come, my heart says, seek God's face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. go with one voice let us pray faithful God the world aches for healing as weapons fire children waste leaders posture borders close ice melts we who bear your name often look away in mercy and power move in our midst Help us fill the sunken places and level what is proud until your glory is revealed to all creation. Hear the sound of love as it is poured out. Friends, nothing you have done, nothing you will ever do, is enough to separate you from the love who, of the one who loved you into existence and who will love you past death. 
And so I declare to you now, let us join together in declaring in the name of Jesus, who is God's zealous son. Let us declare our stories are known, our sins are forgiven, our work has just begun. Please be seated. And I'd like to invite Harriet and any other friends who are here this morning who would like to come down to join me. Harriet, I'm so glad you're here. Okay. So I want us to think first about words. Sometimes when the same word can have two different meanings. So I, got some, I brought some things to help us think about that. What do you think that is? A thing that came from a tree, but it fell off years ago. Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of part of the outside of a tree, kind of like the skin of a tree. Do you know that there's a name for that? Do you know that name? It's called the bark of a tree. But do you know another meaning for the word bark? Skin. Well, yeah, 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 this is like the skin of a tree, but you have at your house a new dog, right? And when that dog makes noise and tries to talk to you, what do we call that? Barking, yeah. So bark can mean either like that outside part of a tree or the noise that a dog makes. Let's try another one. Okay, so what's that? A it's a nail. Can you think of another meaning for the word nail? Oops, I think you're doing something right now. What's that? Something. Oh, but what part of our body is? That's our finger nail. So there's a na the word nail can mean something that we hammer or it can be a part of our body. I got two more. Can you do two more? Okay. All right. What have we got here? Leaves. leaves. And you know what? There's another way we use the word leaves. Like when the party is over and everyone goes home, we say that they, they people leave, right? So there's another. Okay. This is the last one. What is it? Do you know? Doesn't look very interesting to you. I can tell by your face. <laughs> this is called squash, and it's a vegetable that we eat. We eat it at my house anyway. But but sometimes, like if somebody's if somebody dropped up on the floor and you stepped on it by accident, we might say you squashed the grape. Right? So sometimes words can have more than one meaning. And that's what happens in today's story from the Bible. So Jesus is in a temple. Have you ever heard the word temple? It's not a word we use very much. How do they like the temple pyramid people? Like a pyramid temple? Yeah, temple like a building, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So in today's story, Jesus confuses all the people around him because he's talking about the word temple and he's using it in a way that they don't know because they think of the word as meaning the building, the very special building where they believe that God lives. So they've built the most beautiful building they could imagine and they thought everyone should come there 
to feel close to God. But Jesus has a different idea about what a temple is. He agrees that it's a place for God to make a home, but he doesn't think that it needs to be a building. You know what? He thought all of our bodies were temples, and all of our bodies together were a temple. And if that's true, and I think we can trust it's true because God, Jesus said it to us, then that means that God wants to be so close to us, to you, to me, to everybody here, that we can think about God living inside of us. And if God wants to live inside of us, inside of our bodies, you know what I think? I think that means that God must think that each of us is beautiful. I think that God must think that each of our bodies is perfect. We don't have to be bigger or smaller or faster or stronger. We don't have to have a different kind of hair or a different kind of skin. Our brain doesn't need to be different. Our feelings don't need to be different. Just exactly the way we are, God says, I want to make a home in you. Can I come live in your heart? And that means that we need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of each other because each of us and all of us are so precious to God. So I have a different kind of prayer today. Are you feeling brave to do a different kind of prayer? Let's stand up for this one. Can we stand up? Okay. All right. So this is a body prayer. And I think you'll notice that we're going to make a cross. Kind of a, so there's the cross up there. We're going to talk more about that. Yeah, you've made a cross. Oh. You've made a cross in a way I had not even imagined. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful cut. Let me sh can I show you one more way? Okay, so you want to do this with me? You can use maybe this hand. Maybe. You can say, God be in my head. God be in my heart. So we kind of made a straight line there. God be in my head. God be in my heart. God be on my left side. God be on my right. Amen. You did that beautifully. Thank you so much for coming up. Today's first reading comes from the fifth book of the Hebrew scriptures. The book of Deuteronomy contains the guidance that the Israelites will need in order to live faithfully in the land that they are about to enter. First, we'll hear a summary of God's covenant with the people, and then we'll hear a very particular dietary instruction. Before you read, please pray with me. Holy God, meet us in these ancient words that they might carry your life to us and so equip us for the challenges of our own day. Give us open minds, willing hands, and hearts inclined toward our neighbors. For we pray in the name of you, <clears throat> the one you sent out of love for the world. Amen. So beginning with chapter 10, verse 12. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth with all that is in it as well, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors before you and chose you, their descendants, after them out of all the peoples as it is today. Circumcise then the foreskin of your heart and do not be stubborn any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty God, awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe who executes justice for the orphan and the widow 
and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And then skipping to chapter 12. When the Lord your God enlarges your territory, as he has promised you, and you say, I am going to eat some meat, because you wish to eat meat, you may eat meat whenever you have the desire. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you shall not eat the life with the meat. Do not eat it. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. Do not eat it so that all may go well with you and your children after you, because you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Before we hear our gospel reading, I would like to share just a little bit of context. Any time that we listen to a portion of the Gospel of John in which there are references to the Jews, we need to remember the social location from which this scripture emerged. The Gospel of John has long been understood to be the last written of the four Gospels, probably during the 80s or 90s. And by that time, the temple that we are going to hear described in this story, by the time it, this is being written, that temple has been destroyed. So John is writing during a time that's a really painful separation from the local synagogues and the religious uh, power structures. There's a separation between Jesus' followers. So it's a, it's a painful time in which he's writing. Those references in the text to the Jews are confusing to us as modern readers because nearly every actor in the story is a Jew. But what is being critiqued in the book of John is not particular to Judaism. 
what is mirrored here is the tendency of religious structures and authorities, including our own, to confuse our understanding and our institutions with the will and the freedom of the living God. So when we hear the words, the Jews, it's often helpful to substitute something like the religious authorities, and then to understand that we too are included in that category. Our central responsibility any time we come to a text is always to ask, how is it that we are being addressed by what is in front of us? Listen then for God's imperative to the church today. The Passover was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered then that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews, or religious leaders, then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The leaders then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they, they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this text comes up every three years in our schedule of readings that we call the lectionary. In March of 2018, I was serving University Presbyterian Church in Chapel Hill when this text appeared in the rotation. It had been a busy week. Friday had come and all that I had on paper was the title that I had submitted for the bulletin on Tuesday. So I left my cell phone number with the receptionist at the church and I headed home to work on my sermon. I wasn't far into the morning when the first call came. It hadn't occurred to me that it was the first week of a new month. Anyone who had not been able to pay their rent on the first was now feeling the heat of that deadline come and gone and the weekend approaching. And the church I was serving had a long practice of helping with utility bills in particular, but also occasionally rent payments. I tried not to begrudge the time that it took to make a few phone calls and to send a few emails to be sure that the landlord would wait until the small check we would issue could be cut and would make up what was lacking. In truth, my colleagues in the office were the ones doing most of the real work. You can see Donna smile as I say that. I was only connecting the dots. Even so, I was aware of my own impatience. So while I waited for those calls to be returned and those emails to be answered, I sat with this text and I tried to imagine the picture that John is painting. What is it that makes Jesus so angry? I wondered. Each of the four Gospels contains a version of this story, but John's stands apart. John doesn't suggest that anyone is being cheated here. He doesn't use that phrase, den of thieves, you may remember from elsewhere. John's portrait is more business as usual. Everyone is just doing what is expected in the temple as a busy holiday season is approaching. John's version stands out for another reason, too. John plants his story at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. We're only in chapter 2. Jesus has just come from a wedding in Cana and a few days with friends and family in Capernaum. There have been 
no reports of tension with religious authorities. The stage has not been set for anger or disruption. Nothing looks out of place until Jesus arrives. These merchants, these animals, they are all right where they belong. Here's the background. By Jesus' day, the feast of the Passover, that great feast of liberation and the feast of unleavened bread, they have been combined into one long springtime festival that lasts for eight days. Enormous crowds made their ways to Jerusalem for this celebration. The ancient historian Josephus reports that more than two million pilgrims would come. So imagine the sound and the smell of all those travelers, as well as many, many animals. Cattle, sheep, birds, they were all required for various temple sacrifices, and also many lambs for the Passover meals. Pilgrims had to travel great distances, but they needed to have perfect, unblemished animals for sacrifice, so they didn't try to bring those animals with them. They had to buy them after they arrived. But the temple couldn't accept the Greek or the Roman coins that passed for currency most places because those coins were stamped with the faces of the emperors, and that smacked of idolatry. So travelers, once they got there, had to exchange their foreign coins for coins that were appropriate in the temple. So all of this is necessary. The animals, the coins, the people, all of it is necessary for appropriate worship as they understood it to take place. We've already talked about the fact that the temple was understood to be the place where God dwelt. Access to God in that holy of holies, which lay at the center of the temple compound, that was believed to be off limits for the safety of the people. Sacrifices were a way to draw closer to God with still a measure of protection. So proximity to that holiest of holies, that central place, was divided according to a social hierarchy. Gentiles were the furthest out, and then women, and then male Israelites, and then male members of the tribe of Levi, and finally priests. The Holy of Holies itself was accessible on only one day of the year, on the Day of Atonement, and then only by the high priest. Now, all those authorities, they knew that there was a prophecy in the book of Zechariah that foretold that when the day of God's coming finally arrived... There would be no more need for trade in the house of the Lord because every animal, every cooking pot, the whole world would be known then as holy to the Lord. So there would be a day coming when there would be no more division into sacred and profane. But the authorities have no reason to believe that Jesus has the right to declare that the Lord's coming is realized. But announce that he does. So when they ask him for a sign, he dares them to destroy the temple, boasting that within three days he can raise it back up. And in that moment, he is pivoting to a new understanding of temple, a new understanding of the place where God dwells. I want to go back to Chapel Hill now. The woman who called on Friday morning looking for help with her rent She called again in the late afternoon as she was getting off from work. She was hoping to find out how things had gone during the day with her landlord and whether and when she might be able to pick up a check. As we talked and shared those details, she thanked me repeatedly and profusely, and then she said, I just knew that if I would be patient, that God would provide But it takes so much patience. Sometimes the patience is so hard to come by. And in that moment, I found my place in the temple story. I was the money lender engaged in business as usual, dispensing my thimble full of provision after all the forms had been completed, confusing our institutional practice 
with the mercy of God. As though I had more pressing things to think about that Friday morning when this sister was the sermon God wanted to write on my heart. An author I like a lot by the name of Debbie Thomas puts it this way. In this story, there is nothing godly about responding to systemic evils with passive acceptance or unexamined complicity. If human bodies are temples, holy places where heaven and earth meet, then it is incumbent upon us to protect these holy places from desecration. If human bodies are temples, my friends, what must we do? Not just what must we think, but what must we do? What must we do about all those holy bodies being bullied in school bathrooms? All those holy bodies at our borders all those holy bodies in Gaza, all those holy bodies on whose backs we have built our wealth. What must we do? The first thing we will do in just a few moments is to gather around that table. And if that doesn't sound revolutionary enough, for you. I want to remind you of the reading that Barbara just shared with us. We heard the injunction there against ever consuming the blood of another creature because the creature's life is understood to belong to God. The life is in the blood and the life belongs to God. So throughout the Old Testament, when an animal is sacrificed, its blood, its life is poured out on the ground so that it can go directly back to its maker. Still today, that principle is honored in the keeping of kosher. We need to know that in order to understand how radical, how groundbreaking is what happens at that table. Because Jesus says no my life is not going to go back to God through the ground. You drink it first. Let it go back to God through all of your lives. That's the invitation. That's the charge of this table. To take his zeal inside of us and then go and unleash it in the world. In the months ahead, as we engage our mission study, we will be wrestling together over where you sense that brave wind blowing. May the morsel of bread and the sip of fruit and the glad company of other seekers be strength for the journey we will share. To God be the glory. Amen.
join in the unison affirmation. The church's story with God did not end with the latest events in scripture. Across the centuries, the company of believers has continued its pilgrimage with the Lord of history. It is a record of faith and faithlessness, glory and shame. We confess we are heirs of this whole story. We are charged to remember our past, to be warned and encouraged by it, but not to live it again. Now is the time of our testing. As God's story with the church moves th through us, we are called to live now as God's servants in the service of people everywhere. Friends, this is the table of the Christ. It is prepared for those who love him and for those who want to love him. Come, feed on his life. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy One, in beginnings beyond our remembering, you called the world into being, but we struggle to remember the sound of your voice. You sent prophets to wake us, poets to sing to us, priests to go between. Still we turned away. And so you came among us to join our life with yours, to carry all our losses, to take away our fear. Jesus ate with us. He handled our wounds. He bathed our feet. He charged us with love. And then he walked toward suffering, knowing that you would meet him there. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Breath of life, be known to us now in the breaking of this bread. Spill again your life into this cup. Fill your people until we breathe as one, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
gathered with his closest friends and knowing what was coming, Jesus took bread from the table and after giving thanks, he broke that bread. And then he gave it to his friends saying, take and eat. This is my body for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same way, he took a cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant. It's sealed in my blood that's been poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink from it, all of you. For whenever it is that we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, as soon as the servers are in place, we will invite you, as you feel led, to come down the center aisle, to take a piece of bread, to take a cup of juice. Um, you're fine to go ahead and receive them while you are up front. There are little baskets on stools on either side. You can drop your cup in there after you have had that. Um, all of the bread is gluten-free. All of the cup is non-alcoholic. Um, so we will take a moment to get in place, and then we will invite you to come as you're ready. Oh, let me also say, I knew I was forgetting something. If you would prefer to stay where you are seated, um, one of us would be happy to bring the meal to you. So if for any reason you'd prefer to remain where you are, if you'll just kind of signal to the person who's wander walking around with cup and juice, they'd be happy to bring it to you. Thank you.
Has everyone in the room who wish to be served been served? Can we bring anything to anybody? If not, let us remember those in the world who have not been served. And then with grateful hearts for all the ways God tends and loves the world, let us pray together. God of all compassion, you have fed us with the law of your Son. You have bound us to each other. Now teach us to live as he lived, serving the world in your name.
maker, receive a blessing for all that may yet be required of you. That love would cast out your fear, that you would be more perfectly abandoned to the will of God, that the peace of the Christ would reign in your hearts and through you would spread over the face of the earth the blessing of God, who is the giver of life and the bearer of pain and the maker of love, be yours this day and always. Amen.